Hi everyone, welcome back. I'm Michael Sandler, your host on Inspire Nation. If you've ever wanted to heal from illness or feel better about your life, then do we have the Art of Healing show for you. Today I'll be talking with Dr. Bernie Siegel, revolutionary doctor and the best-selling author of numerous books including Love Medicine and Miracles, Love Animals and Miracles, and a book that's dropped my jaw to the floor, The Art of Healing. And that's just what I want to talk with Bernie about today, about how to uncover your hidden wisdom and potential for self-healing and for happiness. That plus we'll talk about a boo-boo rescue from 3,000 miles away, love me teddy bears in cemeteries, why a heart-lung transplant patient would be dying for a beer, what do a box of crayons, a water gun, a noisemaker, and a magic marker have in common? What Buddy the Dog said about riding in cars? Why a case of amnesia may be the greatest gift in the world? Flipping coins and first dates? And what in the world hope, miracle, and sex have to do with one another? <laughs> gotcha. So welcome to the show, Bernie. Are you ready to shine? You got so many points. I think we'll need a couple of days to cover everything. <laughs> Well, we'll do what we can to go through them, and we were talking about one before we started the show, which I think actually might be a great story to tell first. Would you mind sharing what happened to you at age four? All right. I've had an interesting life, and I'm, I'm trying to put together a book of memoirs because I want people to know what their potential is. You know, mm -hmm. it's not so much sharing my experience, just talking about me. But talking about my experience, because everyone could experience what I'm experiencing. We're all human beings. But at age four, there were carpenters working in the house. And in those days, without all kinds of equipment, they would put the nails in their mouth and pull them out, you know, and hammer them into the wood. And I was sitting on my bed, home in bed with an ear infection, and I had a toy telephone. And since they were doing things, I started doing things and I unscrewed the dial on the telephone mm -hmm. and then put the pieces in my mouth, imitating them. And the next thing I know, I aspirated them and I couldn't breathe. And I, I, I always say to people, it is so incredibly painful because your body is sucking air as hard as it can, your diaphragm, your ribs. I mean, I never forget that pain. And then suddenly I was free of pain. And I thought, wow, that's nice. But then I realized you're not in your body anymore. That kid on the bed is dying and you're, you've left. And also, that, the way I said that, the kid on the bed, that wasn't me anymore. Mm -hmm. I thought that was an interesting thing for a four-year-old to realize I'm not the body. I'm the spirit. I'm the consciousness. So the kid on the bed is dying. But it was so exciting to be out of my body, free of pain, looking around, um, thinking about a God, too. Uh, it just so, so much was going through me. And then, like most kids, I thought, uh-oh, you're enjoying this, but your parents are going to come in and find you dead. And I thought about it. And my decision was, I prefer being dead. Now, the next thing, I mean, I know I've got an angel. I even know his name. It happens to be George, if you'd like to know. But because so many times I could have been killed or seriously injured and I wasn't. It was like somebody took care of me. I mean, even falling off the roof once and landing on my feet. How do you manage that when a ladder breaks? You know, it's like somebody put me down. But anyway, um, the kid on the bed had a seizure. And with the seizure, he started vomiting. And the reason I say it's like I have an angel, I thought about that later. That's like a Heimlich maneuver. Mm -hmm. You know, suddenly everything is being projected out. Reverse. So the pieces, the toy pieces came flying out with the vomit and the kid took a breath again. And then I had no choice. I mean, I say that because I felt like I, a vacuum cleaner sucked me back into my body. And I was mad as hell. But I thought, well, God's in charge of your schedule, so stop <laughs> complaining. You know, it's not up to you. Um, and then my mother came in, and she was not interested at all <laughs> in what I had thought was so wonderful. You know, there's vomit. The kid is almost choked. I mean, she was not in the mood. And I say that because there was a book written called uh, Heaven is for Real mm -hmm. by the father of another four-year-old 
who almost had a near-death experience, I think after he had appendicitis and was very critically ill in the hospital. Um, and he thought the kid was nuts when he started telling him his experiences until he realized this kid knows things he could not have possibly have known as a four-year-old. In other words, the people he met, mm -hmm. you know, uh, that he could not have known. So the father ends up writing a book. But my mother was not in the mood for my interesting experience. But I can tell you, as a pediatric surgeon, that most kids, when you talk to them about near-death experiences, will tell you they preferred being dead. They felt bad that their parents would have to deal with it. But again, when you're four years old, what else could be more interesting than that? So I, I think that had an effect on me in my life, even though it was not something I consciously kept thinking over or talking to people about. But it just let me know that this is for real and I could accept things that patients told me. You know, a lot of times patients would say to me, we know you're not a normal doctor, so we can talk to you. <laughs> and tell you what happened. Because if they're afraid, you know, mm -hmm. when the near-death experience started being public, if you went into a patient and said, did you have a near-death experience? When they were resuscitated, everybody said, no, no, no. And what I learned later was they're saying no because they don't want to be considered, you know, psychotic uh, with this crazy stuff. But once they knew Siegel isn't a normal doctor, so if he asks you, you can tell him. And uh, one man, if, because once I start telling stories, they never end. But this was a blind patient of mine. Mm -hmm. He had diabetes, lost his sight, and had uh, cardiac arrest in the hospital, was resuscitated. And he said to his wife, because she and I were standing at the bedside, oh, my God, he said, I left my body. It was incredible. And she said, honey, that's nuts. That stuff is crazy. It doesn't really happen. He said, oh, yeah, you're wearing a green dress. And they told you to move away and you sat in the corner of the room while they resuscitated me. And the doctor dropped his pen. It's under the, you know, my bed. And we bent down and there was a pen that one of the doctors who was resuscitating him had dropped out of his pocket. And, you know, then the wife was like, oh, I mean, how do you deny what her husband just told her? How does he know what color dress she has on? And she knows he's blind. So those were things, again, that once people were comfortable they would tell me. And it isn't just me. Um, as I began to explore and read uh, many, many years ago, Carl Jung, he interpreted a dream, diagnosed a brain tumor. And he worked with dreams, drawings, uh, consciousness, but it's not told to doctors. You know, when we're trained, nobody says Carl Jung interpreted a dream. Um, in one of my books called The Book of Miracles, we just had people send in stories. Mm -hmm. And they're not coincidences. The woman said she went to bed one night. Into her dream, uh, a woman appeared, dark skin with an accent, who said, you have a lump in your right breast and it needs to be evaluated. The woman said, when I woke up next morning, sure enough, there's a lump there. So I go and I have it checked. And the biopsy showed it's cancer. And they said to me, the doctor will be coming in in a few minutes who will be taking care of you and you, you know, directing your treatment for your cancer. And who do you think walks into the room? The doctor from her dream. She was from India and, you know, had an accent, etc. But, you know, when those things happen to you, I always say, I live by my experience. I don't say, oh, I can't believe that. It happened. I do believe it. If I can't explain it, that's another issue. But it happened. And I think it has more to do, as I say, with the immortality in a sense of consciousness. So we could talk about past lives and near death. And it's the consciousness that we're connecting with so that you and I can be aware of what went on in a previous life. I mean, one of the things I always feel is the other night, a few months ago, uh, a five-year-old appeared mm -hmm. with a violin in front of a concert orchestra and played the violin. Now, you tell me how many five-year-olds you can train to perform with a violin in a concert orchestra. And I really felt, okay, here's a kid who has the consciousness mm -hmm. of that violinist, so it's easy for her to get up and do that. And I've seen it with some of our kids, where they walk over to the piano and start playing the piano. And if you left me there for a month, I couldn't do it. 
you know, and it's got to be something in them uh, so they're able to do it. And it's not something that just that they've learned because it was just something they could walk over and do and feel perfectly comfortable at it. Let's let's go from there. This is perfect. I want to talk more about the Jungian side of things. I was out for a run yesterday. I had a Jungian experience that I'm still trying to understand. I'm out for the run in a woods, and um, out of the corner of my eye, I see a car off the trail on, on, uh, around the edge of this road. And I run over to it, and it is the vehicle, the DeLorean from the movie Back to the Future. And I'm literally standing there in front of the time machine that Michael J. Fox was in. And I'm thinking to myself, what does this message mean for me? And that was literal. That wasn't in a dream. This is photographed on Facebook. I'm going, what does this mean? You became what I understand you would call yourself a Jungian surgeon. Right. What did that mean? Well, it means I, I was, was not just a mechanic, you see. So I treated the entire person, as Jung said, mind and body are a unit. Mm -hmm. And I keep saying, see, if you had a problem with your car, you fix that part. You have a specialist. And that's what doctors are trained to do. Oh, you got a heart problem. We'll send you to a cardiologist. You have cancer. We'll send you to an oncologist. But they need to remember you're a unit, you see. And so the mind is incredibly powerful. Again, I could tell you more stories about people who were not receiving cancer treatment due to medical errors. They were not being radiated, were not getting chemotherapy, uh, had an incision, but did not have the full surgery. Mm -hmm. Yet they all responded as if they did. And the doctors didn't know it. That's how I heard these stories. You know what I mean? That a doctor doesn't know he's not radiating people because there's something wrong with the machine. And he inspects it once a month. So he doesn't know for a month that something is not right because it had been repaired. And then a month later, he checked it. And he said to me, oh, my God, I haven't treated anybody. I said, you're not an idiot. Don't you realize what happened? What do you mean? I said, obviously, all the patients acted as if they were being treated. So you didn't know they weren't. He almost fainted. You know, it never occurred to him that this that people could have side effects and shrinking tumors because they thought they were being treated. Now, I can also tell you the other side of the coin. Mm -hmm. There are radiation therapists who have called me and said, I thought the machine was broken. Then I saw your name in the chart and I knew it was a crazy patient. And he said to the patient, why don't you react to radiation? She said, I get out of the way and I let it go to my tumor. <laughs> now, how the hell do you manage that? But you see, that's the mind body that some people see treatment as a gift from God. Mm -hmm. And other people have drawn the same treatment as the devil giving me poison. You know, meaning their doctor is the devil giving them this terrible treatment. Um, and, and that's the part that doctors aren't trained to do. I have an article on my website called Deceiving People Into Health. Because I learned that people, I did a lot of children's surgery. Mm -hmm. The kids saw me as this authority they could believe in. And I began to see that they interpreted my words in a different way. So you'll go to sleep and you go in the operating room had the kids falling asleep when they were wheeled into the room. See, my thought is, I'm trying to tell you about anesthesia, which will prevent you from having pain and etc. But they heard the word sleep. So they fell asleep. And it, it became a joke in the operating room because I'd wheel one of my patients in and they'd fall asleep on the stretcher. And everybody in the room would burst out laughing. You know, here's Siegel again. Um, one boy, I always have to tell about him, he had appendicitis. And I told him, you'll go to sleep and you go in the operating room. We wheeled him in. He turns over and goes to sleep. So I pick him up, turn him back, and put him on the operating table. And he starts screaming at me. He wakes up. I said, what are you screaming about? I sleep on my stomach. And you said I sleep in the operating room. <laughs> and I said, I can't get your appendix from the back. Oh, all right. And then he stopped fighting with me. But, I mean, that's how literally they took it. So... That's why I say deceiving people. It's okay to lie to your kids for their benefit. You know, if you gave them a vitamin pill and told them it would remove all, you know, their nausea, their pain, their, and it did, that's wonderful. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us from there about uh, signs and symbols and the importance in it or, or what you see in a penny even? Oh, well, to me, the penny, the words, um, 
In God We Trust, mm -hmm. uh, Liberty, and Abe Lincoln. And liberty means we have the freedom to be who we want to be. Uh, as my mother would say, do what makes you happy. That used to drive me crazy as a kid because she never helped me make decisions. But I realized later she was very therapeutic. Mm -hmm. You know, she wasn't telling me what I had to do, do what makes you happy. And so again, the liberty, the freedom to be who you are and to have faith in God we trust. And I'm not getting into an argument over religion is a problem, okay? God is not. God has given us the potential. You see, you cut your finger, you don't bleed to death. Who figured that one out? How to come bacteria alter their genes and become resistant to antibiotics? Who figured that one out? So again, the survival mechanisms are built into us. So I trust God, I have faith. And I, may, I always say to people, there are two ways to pray. If you're angry, you can yell, give God help. Mm -hmm. Because I've seen people get better doing that. And I mean literally, getting into bed one night and saying, God, I can't stand it anymore. I either want to die tonight or you've got to stop all this. And she got better. Um, and I mean, she really screamed at God. What do you it think happened? Well, it, it's the change in her then. She got it all out. You know what I mean? All the anger, the p depression, all the things going on, suddenly she weren't stored in her body anymore. Mm -hmm. She gave it to God. And another woman uh, went home to die, came back to the office, and the tumor was gone. I mean, it was big enough in her abdomen to feel it, and it was gone. And her words, when I said, tell everybody what you did, oh, I left my troubles to God. So again, it's having the faith and realizing your potential or, or you can argue with God and be angry, but either way it can work depending on what that person feels and needs. But think of how hard it is, you know, all our lives, leave your troubles to God. How many of us can do that? You know, we get up in the morning with, oh my God, what do I have to do today? Well, leave it to God. Yeah, right. <laughs> So, but it's what it brings to those people. And I've seen many of them who had that kind of faith. Well, as another one said in a letter to me, when I let God into my prison, that was her life and how she was brought up. Mm -hmm. I mean, her parents told her to commit suicide. They did and so did all her siblings. She's the only one alive from her family. She said, when I let love into my prison, it changed every negative item in it, meaning the experiences in my life, and turned them into something meaningful. Wow. And she's become my teacher. She's alive today, way after any doctor, you know, would have predicted. This is important. Thank you for sharing on this. When you're a child and your parent, I, I, can't, I, I can't even fathom that one, the wiring that would do to a child. Mm -hmm. What did she do that we can learn from to flip that wiring? Well, first of all, let me say that the biggest public health issue on the planet is parenting. Mm -hmm. Harvard students were asked, did your parents love you? No. 98% had suffered a major illness by middle age. Yes, they loved me. 24% had. Uh, this I can tell you. Go into any assisted living facility and say, did your parents love you? And everybody there looks at you like you're nuts. You know, they're 80 and 90 years old, and they all say, yeah, of course. What kind of stupid question is that? Um, yeah, go into high school and ask that. When you ask high school students, write a suicide note and a love note, the suicide pile is three to four times higher than the love pile. See, why should you commit suicide? Why are you worth loving? And that's the part that, that gets stored, and I mean this. Mm -hmm. uh, psychologist Alice Miller writes about it. A childhood is stored up in our bodies, and someday the body will present its bill. So you can tell, to get back to Jungian stuff, you get p medical students who've done in one study where they drew pictures of themselves and fill out a personality profile. Mm -hmm. And the psychiatrist who did the study said, I mean, she wasn't a great believer in all this. She was doing a study. But she said, when I looked them all up 35 years later, I could tell what diseases they were going to get and what part of the body it was in from their personality profiles and drawings. So again, it's that storage. Now to get back to Susan, she came to my office when I was starting all the support groups for people and screaming, just what a horrible life and my horrible parents and uh, and she just went on screaming and screaming and I'm, 
you know, I didn't know what the hell to do. So I sat there listening. Mm -hmm. um, except one time she told me what it made a difference. I don't want to use the word in this program. She said, but she said, I said something about her father because all she kept complaining about. I said, oh, bleep your father. And she said, that's when I started to get better. <laughs> because, I mean, it's like, what the hell's the point of coming here and screaming all over again? You did last week, too. And, but what I learned was getting the anger out. Mm -hmm. She was no longer storing it and attacking her body. And I remember Louise Hay one day when she and I were on a stage helping people with AIDS. Somebody in the audience got up and mentioned that, that she had an autoimmune disease. And Louise immediately said, who do you need to express your anger at? And the woman said, oh, my mother. I mean, but it struck me, you know, her question to this person immediately. And it was very much like Susan. I sat there listening to her because I didn't know what the hell to do for her. Thank goodness. And I listened. And then she got it all out and heard herself. It's something I also learned from Helen Keller. Well, if I had to give you this test question, you have to be blind or deaf tomorrow morning. Which would you choose? Blind. I don't know why. You made the right choice. Helen Keller. Mm -hmm. I've heard of the stars of the rainbows, the play of light on the waves. These I would like to see. But far more than sight, I wish for my ears to be open. The voice of a friend, the imaginations of Mozart. Life without these is darker by far than blindness. And when I read that, because Louise, I mean, Helen Keller's stuff is just wonderful to read about her surviving. You know, you're blind and deaf when you're four years old, but she's not mad at God. I mean, just all of it, you know, uh, it, it's like discipline, things that she learned from. And that's, again, good therapy. When you're going through hell, what am I to learn from it? So what I learned was from, from Helen was listen to people so they hear themselves. And then I got credit. I mean this. It was amusing sometimes because you don't say any, anything to somebody for an hour and 20 minutes. It's mm -hmm. really happening. And at the end of it, the woman said to me, that's the greatest conversation I ever had with anyone. And all I ever did was go, mm, mm hmm yeah, oh, my. <laughs> but I realized she was talking to herself, and now she knows who she is and what she needs to do. But when you quit with the advice, oh, Doug Siegel, I got a problem. Okay, take this pill, read this book, do this exercise, you know, help. But if you listen to them, then they realize there are books to read, things to do. You know what I mean? And then they thank you for opening their minds up. Is drawing another way that somebody can, I almost want to say, listen to themselves? Yeah. The, the consciousness speaks through dreams and images. Mm-hmm. Even the Bible says God speaks in dreams, you know, and drawing, not, not the word drawing, in dreams and images. That's, I think, what's in the Bible. But that's the part, again, that blew my mind. Because I drew a picture for Elizabeth Kugler-Ross when I was struggling with my issues as a doctor. What do I mean? You're not trained to take care of people. You're not trained to deal with suffering. You know, I had a lot of questions to ask God. Why did you make a world like this? I've learned why. But again, um, I was struggling. So I went to workshops that Elizabeth was running. She became a real teacher and therapist for me. But one day she said, Bernie, draw a picture for me. So I drew this outdoor scene from a meditation. And the first question to me was, why is 11 important? I said, why do you ask that? You drew 11 trees. Oh, I've been doing this work 11 months. <clears throat> what are you covering up? Huh? What is that about? Bernie, it's a white piece of paper. You took a white crayon to make snow on the mountain. It's already white. You added a layer. What are you covering up? And that was all my feelings and emotions. And, I mean, when she was done with me, you know, from this meaningless drawing of a, an image I created in my own mind, I thought, this is incredible. I'm going to take crayons to the hospital. So I started saying to patients, hey, draw me a picture. Mm -hmm. And, of course, everybody in the hospital thought I was nuts. But then they stop thinking I'm nuts because they say nobody's against success and interest. They began to see that people were drawing anatomy, literally drawing their body parts without knowing they were drawing it. It could be a tree, you know, uh, it could be a stream. But when I look at it, I see that it resembles anatomy. And again, there was a therapist um, I saw in London 
Susan Bach, B-A-C-H. Mm -hmm. She wrote a book, which I had no idea of until I met her, uh, about she, she had children with leukemia draw pictures. And then she wrote about how much they were revealing. Um, and I went to see her to learn more. And she said Jung was fascinated by the somatic aspects of the drawings. I said, that's because he knew anatomy. He's a doctor. Art therapists don't know anatomy, so they don't see what I notice. Mm -hmm. And I used to bring her drawings just to impress her. And I show someone I lecture because some are, are humorous in terms of kids bringing drawings and, you know, what parts of their anatomy, like a little boy who's going to be circumcised. And he brought two pictures, said this is like before, this is like after. And they're airplanes, but the plane looks like a circumcised <laughs> and uncircumcised penis. So you hold it up in front of an audience and I say, what operation did he have? And usually they guess correctly mm -hmm. when they look at it. Yeah. Um, and you see, those are the things that changed belief systems in the hospital. Um, because it wasn't just me giving a lecture. It's look, and again, about consciousness. I've had children draw a picture of the operating room they've never been in. They're sitting in the waiting room and they draw a picture with the lights, the color of the drapes, how many people, uh, all these symbols are in the drawing. And I don't mean that it's exactly what, you know, the light over the operating table looks like, but it's a yellow, you know, color so you know it's that bright light and uh, it's so obvious and uh, and even uh, it's hard for me all these memories come back after a while the anesthesiologist made up a coloring book in the outpatient operating room because it got so interesting he literally put a book together uh, with eight or ten pages and the kids could fill it in and draw and it helped them like on the first page it said you'll meet an anesthesiologist who's wearing an outfit that looks like green pajamas. And then there's a picture of the operating room. Well, one of the kids drew the anesthesiologist in red. Mm -hmm. So when I looked at his little booklet, I went over to the anesthesiologist. I said, you know, red is an emotional color. You know, it's like a warning sign. Uh, and it says here, he, you're wearing green. And the anesthesiologist said, Bernie, his mother has muscular dystrophy he could have an adverse reaction to muscle relaxants and it could really damage his brain, increase body temperature and so forth. I said, then look at the last page. If he draws himself purple, I'm sending him home because that's a spiritual color and he may be saying I'm gonna die. But on the last page, he drew himself in red and black which said to me, I'm not happy and I'm hurting, you know, after the surgery. So we went ahead with it. But those are the things that, you know, you find fascinating that we tell you it's green and you draw it in red. So what this, this kind of tangents from here, um, but it goes into more of a life picture. And since we're talking about parenting and, and the importance of parenting, what can parents learn? In fact, there's one point in the book that you said kids, parents should have their kids make two drawings. I think one a self portrait right. and one of their family say they're going to put them on the fridge. Yeah. Yeah. Don't tell them you're analyzing them because <laughs> our kids, when they'd see me coming down the hall with their bedroom, you know, they'd slump over their drawing so I couldn't see it because they'd worry that I'm going to interpret, mm -hmm. you know, whatever they were drawing. But if they had a problem, that was different. Hey, Dad, what should I draw? See? And I would say, OK, this is what you need to draw and help them. But see what it did, like one child with cancer said, I don't get enough time for my family. Now, if I start talking to the family and criticizing and telling them what to do. You can spend your whole day and they'll deny it. No, we're good parents. I said, honey, draw a picture. She drew herself sitting alone on a chair. Mm -hmm. Her siblings, two or three of them, and the parents are sitting on a sofa with an extra empty seat. There was room for her, but the parents' arms are wrapped around the other kids and so forth. And I showed it to the parents. I said, look how she feels. Thank you. We'll go home and change things. And they were forever grateful for that. And it wasn't Siegel, you know, or the school teacher saying, you're terrible parents. It's the child speaking. And that's why I say that to the parents. Because a lot of times when I go in to speak to kids and read stories to them, I say, draw a picture of your own family. And then the teachers are like, how the hell did you know that about them? I said, look at the picture. And it, again, if the parents come in, 
you can show it to them and say, look how your child feels. Nobody's touching each other. Everybody's all over the place. You know, daddy's at work, mom's in the kitchen, my brother's in the bedroom, I'm in the front yard. And then there are other families that I really call a family circle where they're embracing each other. And mama is touching everybody in the family from where she's standing. Yeah, so that's all kinds of channels of communication. And uh, at other times, everybody's all separate. You know, like one doctor friend of mine and seven kids, he developed cancer. He wanted to know how his kids are doing. Mm -hmm. I said, draw a picture of your family. He said, you're nuts. They're all over the place. What, what, what's that going to help? Draw the picture, Frank. He did. And the one who needed the most help, of course, was the lawyer. See, he's trained to think, not feel. So he's all dressed in black, not touching anybody else in the family, whereas all the others at least had some contacts and were sharing. And I said, get on the phone and talk to him because he needs your help. And those are things that, again, intuitively we know. Uh, the key, and I've heard this in so many themes and fairy tales and everything else, is the still pond, the quiet mind. Imagine being an ugly duckling. Mm -hmm. They throw you out of the house. So what do you do? Well, this is a quote from a patient. My mother's words were eating away at me and maybe gave me cancer. She spent her life, see, resenting her mother for dressing her in dark clothes and telling her she's a failure and an embarrassment. But the ugly duckling didn't do that. He went off on his own. And one day on a still pond, he realizes, I'm a swan. When he sees other swans and wishes he were one, and he looks down and sees his reflection. And again, good old Joseph Campbell, he used it differently. A tiger dies giving birth. Mm -hmm. What's nice about the goat she was chasing, they come over and say, all right, let's raise this little kid. See, they don't come over and say, let's kill that. His mother was after us. No, let's raise him. So the goat grows up thinking he's, uh, I mean, the tiger grows up thinking he's a goat. Yep. Until another tiger comes along. And then, as Campbell says, where does he take him? To his still pond. He says, look, dumbbell, you're not a goat, you're a tiger. And um, I have to add, Campbell adds humor into it. You know, he says, here's a piece of meat. And the little tiger says, no, I'm a vegetarian. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but again, I've learned this. that, and, and even in Kabbalah. See, that's the part I say. Look for common themes. If you find something in six different places, everybody's saying the same thing. It must work. And Kabbalah says, sit quietly in a room by yourself. Light a candle. Quiet your mind, and all will be made clear to you. And it's the same. And I've had a lot of friends uh, teaching me. My one friend, you know, communicating with animals, she's always saying, Bernie, quiet your mind. Stop screaming the pet's name when you can't find it. Quiet your mind. You'll get into the animal's mind. I think you asked, if I understand right, Buddy, who was freaking out each time you took him in a car, mm. you ended up... It yeah, I, I hear voices. See, you mentioned it was when you were out jogging, you know, and then you told the story. I think when we're out running, you're doing a repetitive exercise, mm -hmm. and your mind doesn't need to pay attention. You know what I mean? And that's when you go into a trance. And I hear voices speaking to me. Now, you could say I'm psychotic. I don't care. But I know it's my little angel talking to me. George. So... I can be walking a dog, you know, jogging, riding a bike, and suddenly I hear a voice. Mm -hmm. And I wrote a book called Buddy's Candle to help people deal with the loss of a loved one. Let me just say that your tears put out your loved one's candle. Okay, that's why it had that name. Uh, and it's about a dog named Buddy and a child. They both develop cancer, and the dog, of course, becomes a therapist for the family. Um, and I walked out of the house with one of another dog that I had. And um, I heard a voice say, go to the animal shelter. Mm -hmm. So I go down there. I walk in, open the door. And again, I don't decide to say these things when I'm in this trance state. The words I'm used to speak. There's a dog sitting by the door. So instead of saying hello to people, I just opened the door and said, what's his name? And of course, his name was Buddy. So I said, all right, I'm here to take him home. And I just put him in the car and off we went. I stopped for gas on the way home. I opened the door to get out to pump the gas. 
Buddy jumps out and starts running down the street. Now, I don't know him. He doesn't know me. I'm screaming his name. Mm -hmm. The traffic is stopping. And finally, everybody like formed a circle and helped me. And we got him and put him back in the car. But then I learned from my friend Amelia, Bernie, quiet your mind. When we got home, I opened the car door and I just looked at him and said, in my mind, I'm not speaking. I'm talking in my head. Why did you do that? And it's amazing. I know that it's coming from the animal. And that's something I could make up. He said, I belong to a couple. The wife was nice, but the husband was an alcoholic. And whenever he'd come home from work, the wife would say, take the dog for a walk. He would put me in the car, go to a bar, drink while I'm locked in the car. Then he would abuse me. And I don't want to be in a car ever again. I said, I would never treat you that way. You don't have to worry. Two weeks later, I go shopping, stop and shop. I always say I go there for therapy because I love interacting with everybody. I know mm -hmm. they all got troubles. So we go down there with the two dogs and uh, I get out of the minivan and go in to stop and shop. When I come back, I see the side door on the minivan is wide open. And I realize you must have pushed the button when you put it in your pocket, it, you know? And I thought, okay, he's gone. Well, I walk up to the car, Buddy was sitting in the open car. The other dog named Furphy, because of all the fur he had, my wife named him, um, is missing. And I start screaming, and then I hear Amelia again. Bernie, stop screaming his name. Quiet your mind. And I immediately really connected. Oh, he's in Stop and Shop looking for me. So I went in to Stop and Shop. And the security guard said, you looking for a dog? I said, yeah, I got him. I got a dog at home, so I'm feeding him and taking care of him. So I took him and put him back in the car. But those are the kinds of things that really convinced me of the truth of the communication of consciousness. And even simple studies with doctors, you know, did the doctor listen to you? Was the doctor nice to you? They studied people with the flu, went mm -hmm. to see their doctor. And they said, no, a doctor didn't listen, didn't give me any time. They were more likely to be sick for a week. The ones who said, oh, yeah, the doctor was so nice and listened and was so helpful. In three or four days, they're fine. So you can't, again, separate these things. That we create our internal chemistry by our thoughts and beliefs. You know, I say Monday morning, we have more heart attacks, strokes, suicides, and illnesses. Canceling Monday isn't going to improve the health of the world. You got to improve the attitude about Monday. Going from there, and thank you for sharing on that. Maybe another element of this communication, of communication of consciousness to us, through us, and for us. Maybe you can share a little bit about dreams. It, yes. I mean, some of the ones I've had I found interesting. Um, and then I began also to talk to patients and say, Have you had a dream? Because sometimes families would come in and say, our mother is nuts. And I'd come out saying, oh, your mother's wonderful. Because they would think she's nuts because she had a dream, you know, about something that she knew. Um, but when I was wondering, did I become a doctor and start running support groups to prove I'm not going to die? You know what I mean? It's all the other people who got the problem. And I may add, I moved my desk against the wall to separate me from all of them. So I wasn't separated from them. Mm -hmm. But... One of my dreams was I'm in a car and I wasn't even driving. It was packed with six people and we went off a cliff and they're all shrieking and screaming. We're going to die. What's going to happen? And I'm sitting there calmly, you know, just sort of enjoying the experience. It's crazy as that sounds. And they all looked at me and said, what the hell's the matter with you? I said, I'm not afraid of dying. And when I woke up, I knew I wasn't a doctor for the wrong reasons, you know, uh, to prove that I'm okay. And the other was a time I had uh, bloody urine. Mm -hmm. And I was so damn busy, I didn't have time to hurry up and go see a doctor. But my partners were upset with me. They said, look, you know, you could have cancer. You don't know what the hell's going on. Would you go see the urologist? That night I went to bed. And this time the dream was of the cancer support group, and which I'm running and was sitting in a circle. And I said, okay, everybody introduce yourself. And we went around the room saying why they were there. And when it came my turn, 
I was about to speak when they all said, but you don't have cancer. And I literally woke up knowing I did not have cancer and I don't have to rush to the doctor. I mean, I did go and yeah, I had an infection. Um, but it told me the truth. And you can dream about the future too. Because as Jung said, the future is unconsciously prepared long in advance. And in the drawings also, there's past, present, and future. Different quadrants of the drawings show those things. Um, so when somebody draws something, like if you said, where should I move to? Where should I live? What job should I take? And I saw it in that upper left quadrant, I know that's where you're headed, see? Mm -hmm. And that's the right choice for you. But um, again, the consciousness knows because we're creating it, the past, present, and future. There's one other I love in the Book of Miracles because I think, when did these things happen? Again, when you quiet your mind and do what I call choosing life, that you choose activities that are good for you and the world. You're not being selfish and only thinking about yourself. And this couple was discharged from the army on the West Coast. So they're going to drive home and have a vacation to the East Coast. But their car, a Pontiac Le Mans, is having trouble every time it comes to a hill. It slowed down. No mechanic knows what the hell's wrong with it. So what do you decide to do? See, that's what impressed me about these people. They said, well, we're going to drive at night so we don't bother people and we'll sleep during the day. Well, there goes your vacation and the fun of your trip. But they, that was their attitude, see? So they're driving through Arizona in the middle of the night. Mm -hmm. They come to a hill. Of course, the car slows down. They see somebody coming up behind them, so they pull off the road. What does the car do? It pulls off in front of them, which made them very anxious. But the man came over and said, you are driving a Pontiac Le Mans. I am the original designer of the car. I know what is wrong with it. I'll take care of it for you. And he explained to them that it was made with a hose that was to siphon excess fuel to mm -hmm. conserve it. But if the hose was siphoning too strongly, it was depleting the motor, the engine of fuel. And then the car had trouble on hills. So he plugged the tube, basically, and from then on, they had no trouble driving. Now, what are the odds of meeting the designer of the car in the middle of Arizona in the middle of the night? Pretty small. <laughs> but again, I think it was because those people made a choice, see, to be kind to others, that they were there at the right moment in the right place. A minute ago, you said something, even before, that's a really cool story. Um, no odds. Zero odds of that. Before that, you said um, people choosing to live. What mm. do you mean by that? Well, the biblical line is, I place before you life and death, good and evil. <laughs> Choose life. Okay? And my definition of that, and I said, it's not choose good, um, it's choose life that you should spend your life doing things that are life enhancing mm -hmm. for everyone, for all living things. And that's when the amazing things start happening for you. You know, the people you meet, uh, the jobs you're offered. I mean, again, it's like, and these are all true stories. Your car breaks down. You're standing there looking for help. Somebody pulls over and says, uh, can I give you a ride? Are you, you know, can I help you? Uh, and the guy was driving home because he was just fired from his job. So he gets in the car and they're driving and he's talking and, you know, yes, I was just fired. And, oh, what kind of work do you do? Oh, boy, I'm looking for somebody, you know, with that, you know, talent and training and so forth. So he, he has a job and a ride to get help, you know, for his car. Now, again, why does that happen? But... I don't think those are coincidences. It, it's the meeting. And that's why when we talked about pennies, I look for pennies. If I find one, I know it's God saying, Bernie, you're on the right path. I'm leaving you, you know, some crumbs for you to pick up and follow. And when my mother died, knowing, I mean, she really lived my sermon. Five doctors called me mm -hmm. to talk to me about her after she died. So I know she had a hell of an impact on all the doctors taking care of her. What oh, were they saying? Pardon? What were they saying? 
just that she was such a wonderful, incredible woman. Because she, you, you know, was like giving my sermon to them and showing them what a difference it made. She developed cancer, leukemia. Mm -hmm. And one day she said to me, oh, I got to go get a blood count. I said, what the hell do you need a blood count for? She said, don't you remember I have leukemia? And I said, no, I didn't remember because she never lived it. You know what I mean? Never lived it as an illness. I mean, she did what I preached and look what happened. You know, it had nothing to do with her death or anything else. Um, and one other um, from Thich Nhat Hanh, he talked about bells of mindfulness. Mm -hmm. I said to people, when the phone rings, don't get frantic and pick it up. Breathe it, breathe in peace. The phone is just ringing right now, just as I decide to tell you that. No coincidence. So the phone rings, how different you feel breathing peace rather than, oh God, I can't answer it, I wonder who it is. Yeah, so I said to people, look, we don't have temple bells, mm -hmm. so use the telephone. When it rings, breathe peace. You, you should. Let it ring four or five times. Now, let me tell you the end of the story. I called my mother. I mean, she's in her 90s, uh, doesn't answer the phone. I'm getting panicky. And then I'm about to hang up and call her neighbor when she said, hello. I said, mom, you okay? Yes. Well, what are you asking? The phone. You didn't answer the phone. I'm doing what you tell people. I'm breathing peace. I said, that's for everybody else, not you. You pick up the phone. But uh, I got her to have people come in, you know, through the day and keep her company uh, because I was the one who was nervous uh, and she loved living in her own home. Beautiful. In fact, you, you shared a story about what she did when your father was passing away. Oh, yeah. To bring laughter to, it, to the situation. That's why that voice. I went out for a walk. Well, let me jump back. On Thursday, my father said to my mother, I need to get out of here. Mm -hmm. And she said, oh, dad wants to get out of bed. I said, no, ma, he wants to get out of his body. That's what he's telling you. You need to talk to him about it. So she agreed. She didn't fight with him, you know. And he said, okay, I'll die on Sunday. Fine. So we let everybody know my father's going to die on Sunday. And, and people have that control, believe me, uh, when they don't feel guilt over, you know, dying. My father was just tired of his body. Breathing was hard, etc. So Sunday morning, I went out before going to the hospital and the voice said to me, how did your parents meet? I said, I don't know. Ask your mother when you get to the hospital. Again, I walk into the hospital room. What would I say as a child who loves his parents? I love you. I'm sorry. Let me hug you. But what came out of my mouth, I couldn't say those words. What came out of my mouth was, how did you two meet? And my mother immediately told the story in which she was sitting with a bunch of girls she didn't know on vacation on a beach. And she said a bunch of boys came down the beach and they tossed coins to see who would get, you know, the other girls. Mm -hmm. And she said, your father lost and got me. Well, every story after that was such a disaster that I began to wonder why my father kept, you know, why my mother kept going out with my father because the things that happened were crazy falling out of a boat when a man yelled, you have to pay before you take the boat. So my father let go of my mother in the boat and she fell in the lake and things like that. Oy vey. <laughs> so my father, again, he's in a coma, but we hear, you have to remember that. I talked to people under anesthesia I, because I knew they were hearing me, even mm -hmm. though the anesthesiologist thought I was nuts, but they learned Siegel's right. They're hearing us. So my mother talking and telling stories, my father began to look so healthy. I mean it, the color came back in his cheeks, a big smile on his face. And I thought next he's going to open his eyes and say, I'm not going to die today. This is fun. But consciousness, we know who's coming and we know who isn't coming because they answered us. My father can't know, but he does know. The last person who said, I'm coming to visit before grandpa dies, walked in the room, was announced, and my father took his last breath. And the other was some of the kids in the room said they saw something leaving his body. Uh, I've heard that story before with even images in 
you know, those automatic phones, uh, not phones, cameras. Uh, this was at a wedding where cameras were left at every table so people could take pictures. Mm -hmm. And in the pictures, there were these like hazy outlines and the father and the brother of the bride had died and everybody felt it was them, that they were in the room uh, right there. And it showed up in more than one camera. So it wasn't something wrong with the camera. And I may also add that when birds, butterflies, all kinds of creatures um, were the favorites of children who died, uh, yeah, they show up later in life as a message from the kids too. And why do I say often this happens more with the children? It's because when the parents meet in a room, compassionate friends, they're there to help each other deal with the loss of a child, they feel perfectly safe. Mm -hmm. You know, I can talk. So, yeah, we even had, while we were talking about a daughter who was murdered and loved birds, when the sister was married after her death, a bird, this was an outdoor wedding, landed in the tree and made such a racket it interrupted the wedding. I mean, it was making so much noise. Everybody's reaction was, oh, your sister's there. What flew in the window Why she's telling us this? A bird into the room. Now, we sat in that room for five years. I never had a bird even bump the glass, you know, and here it is flying in. And I can go on telling you more stories. Uh, well, let me tell you one more that I wrote about called You Can't Sleep With a Butterfly. Mm -hmm. Because that was a literal line uh, when I said to my wife, you can't sleep with a butterfly. We went to Hawaii, yeah. uh, island of Hawaii. One of my patients had died there to straighten out her relationship with her mother. And then she stayed with her mother. We get there a couple of years later. We go into a store. There's a butterfly in the store that seemed confused by the lights. And we're, believe me, we're into saving lives uh, all the time, all kinds of creatures. That's why in the book, Love Animals and Miracles, I talk about the Seagull Zoo. You know, we're always rescuing things, uh, a reverence for life, as Schweitzer talked about. So we rescue the butterfly. My wife puts her hand up, lands on her hand, we walk outside. But it doesn't fly away. It hops up on her shoulder. We can't get it to go. So I said, look, get in the car. We have to go back to the hotel. We drive back to the hotel. We get out. I expect the butterfly to fly, but it goes up to our room. And, you know, it became part of the family. We have dinner. I put a dish of uh, sugar water on the table. And um, I said to my wife, honey, it's bedtime and you cannot sleep with a butterfly. So go on the porch and get rid of it. My wife goes out on the porch and brushed it off her left shoulder. Came back in the apartment. Honey, I got rid of it. No, you didn't. Look at your other shoulder. It came back in on her other shoulder. At that point, I really felt this is my patient's spirit. So I started talking to the butterfly like a person. I said, look, we need to go to bed. You go ahead and drink your sugar water. And tomorrow I'm doing an outdoor workshop. I'm going to put you in a bag. You'll go there with us and I will open the bag and you'll fly out. And I'll talk about the symbolism of the butterfly as a symbol of transformation. And sure enough, next day I have the bag, butterfly jumps in, we drive there, open the bag, it flies out. And what impressed me even more, it flew over our heads from nine in the morning till five at night. When the workshop was over, that's when it flew away. And I have multiple pictures of my wife with it in her hand, on her shoulder. I mean, you can't explain to me how that butterfly behaved. You know, uh, and, and and another a father was telling me that his son loved butterflies. His room was filled with, you know, uh, exhibits of butterflies and his son died. And he went for a walk after the funeral mm -hmm. in Connecticut and a butterfly started walking with him, you know, following him. And it was beautiful, he said. So I went home, went up to my son's room and found out it's a butterfly that is only found in South America. Now, what's it doing in Connecticut? You know, and you know, it's my son. Yeah, saying goodbye. What, how do all of these pieces fit together for us to understand how to either live our lives or for healing? Or what's kind of the meta 
big picture no, message think, here. Thank you. That's a good question because, you know, why isn't it the perfect world? I mean, God's message to me was a perfect world is not creation. It's a magic trick. Mm -hmm. You're here to live and learn. So to me, life is a school. And if we raise our level of consciousness, then we will make the future better for everybody. You know, think of some of the wonderful people who have lived, you know, from a Nelson Mandela who is in a concentration camp and learns about forgiveness and helps others or a Helen Keller. Uh, I mean, just so many wonderful teachers that, you know, who have gone through hell and have learned from it and are teaching others. So life is a school. And yes, our bodies at some point die. But our consciousness doesn't and goes on. Say. And even the disbelievers, like that neurosurgeon who wrote a bestseller. Uh, Dr. Know, Eben Alexander. Yeah. I mean, why does he write it? Because look what happened to me. You know, before that, it's all nuts. It's your brain waves. It's, you know, but suddenly it isn't anymore. And that's why it's easier for me to be open minded. You know, a friend asked me over the telephone, why are you living this life? I went into a trance. Now, what she was asking me is, why are you so damn busy? See, if I said, I have an interview, I have a this, that, Bernie, why are you living this life? You know, why don't you take it easy? Give yourself a break. But when she said, why are you living this life? I went into a trance mm -hmm. and saw myself with a sword in my hand, killing. And I said to her, oh, my God, maybe that's why I'm a surgeon, to help people with the knife. It, it, it was, and I had a full past life experience not because of a therapist, but because somebody said to me, why are you living this life? It was so emotional, I cried for hours. I'm not going to get into who I killed and what, but it all had so much meaning. And then even to emphasize it, one of our kids, he's a little pipsqueak, comes home from school. In art class, what does he do? And I show this slide too when I lecture. He wrote the word words endlessly on a canvas. Teacher thought he was nuts. But you realize when you leave no space between words, 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 they become swords, swords, swords. And when he came in with it, it was like therapy for me that I could kill or cure people with a knife or a sword, you know, or a word. And uh, doctors aren't trained to talk to people. So there are times where, you know, when you say to somebody, oh, you have a week to live or yeah, yeah, they go home and die because you take their hope away. But I learned about words and swords. And why would a kid do that? You know, I mean, what made him? And again, I'd say it had something to do with consciousness. But if we keep thinking about going up in grades, mm -hmm. you know, if we all became postgraduate students of life and understood life and that we are one family, then the future would be better for everybody. I mean, one of the things I'm always saying, you know, when the Black Lives Matter came out, um, I like the message that I learned as a surgeon. We're all the same color inside. And uh, I've painted that in places. Of course, it gets painted over after a while. But, um, you know, but that's the message. We're all the same inside. It doesn't matter what color you are on the outside. If I'm operating on you, I don't have to worry that you're different than other people. Um, and, and as an artist, too, I can tell you, we're not black and white you know, or yellow, we're full of colors. Skin is beautiful. Um, and and uh, one thing I've learned uh, that the kids understand, and one minister who was at my house, I knew he was the kind of guy who would. He was a black minister, and he and I had a long conversation about something. And when we went out to the car, he left two of his friends in the car. And I said, why don't you bring them in? Maybe he didn't know we were going to talk, you know, as much as we did because I never stop. But I said to his friends, I have a photograph of one of us, and you can't tell who it is. What's it a photograph of? And they looked at me like I'm nuts. He's black, you're white, what are you talking about? But the minister immediately pointed his finger at his heart, you know, and I said, yes, I knew he'd know the answer mm -hmm. to tell you that we're all the same inside. And the kids know that too. See, I could do that in third grade with third graders and say, where are we all alike? And they all point to their insides and, and it's so beautiful. But again, then we start growing up and 
we become different. And, and I've learned that love and laughter make us one. Again, if you have more time for story, my wife and I walked into a uh, diner to get something to eat. There was a table, a round table of about seven or eight black people. And I walked over to it with my wife because I'm, I'm nuts. I, I, I'm like a kid. I walked over and I said to them all, hey, I'm sorry we're late. I don't even know them. You know, it's like we're going to sit down and join. And they busted out laughing. And my wife tells them how handsome they are laughing and everything. And then we went over and sat down. And when we were done, I walked back to their table and said, hey, we finished first. Because they were obviously having a meeting. And one of them said, I had a feeling you were going to pay for our meals. And I said, you're reading my consciousness. That is exactly what I wanted to do. And they said, no, no, we're just here having a meeting with cup, you know, coffee and a few things. It's not a big deal. And I said, well, then I won't have to pay very much. <laughs> you know, we laughed some more. And we were friends who never knew each other, mm -hmm. but we laughed together and had so much fun about not, nothing, you know, about nonsense. And I wrote this in a newspaper article that I was writing for about 10 years. And the editors, who were new editors, that's why I've given it up, they took the word blackout. I said, why are you doing that? The whole point is how humor made us family. Mm -hmm. uh, when I told this in another restaurant of the people, one of the waiters showed me there was a table with eight girls and nine seats. So I went over and joined the girls. And, you know, and we ended up laughing, too. Uh, but again, they didn't take the word girls out of my article, you know, but black they couldn't deal with. And that's the sad part, you know, that to me, we're all family and we've all got wounds and troubles. And I may add, if you want to know more about people and help them more, reveal your wounds. While in Stop and Shop, I was poked in the back by a woman who had a bandage over her eye. Mm -hmm. I said... Oh, when she poked me, I turned around. She said, you're the only person in Stop and Shop who hasn't asked me what happened. That blew my mind. She's got a visible wound. Everybody's talking to her. But it reminded me, when I shaved my head in the 1970s, everybody knew I had troubles. It wasn't a normal way to behave when everybody's wearing their hair down to their shoulders, the guys, and I'm shaving my head. So people lined up to talk to me in the hospital. And I realized it's because they know I've got my issues. They can talk to me. My sense of humor, I have to tell you. When the woman said, uh, you're the only person who hasn't asked me what happened, I said, because I know what happened. Really? Yes. I have an abusive spouse also. And then she didn't know what to do with me. Uh, <laughs> but it, again, if you reveal wounds, mm -hmm. people talk to you. Because they don't think of you you know, if you're walking down an aisle, you don't think, oh, here comes somebody with AIDS. Here comes somebody with cancer. Here comes somebody whose loved one has just died, you know. But I know that those things are true. So I react to everybody in that way. And there's a line from uh, Thornton Wilder that's beautiful. An angel refuses to heal a doctor while he's letting other people <clears throat> enter this pool uh, where the waters have been stirred and will heal them. And the doctor says, why can't I go in? Just because I'm a doctor? No. Without your wound, where would your power be? It's your melancholy that makes your low voice tremble into the, uh, into the hearts of men. The very angels themselves cannot persuade the wretched and blundering children on earth as can one human being broken on the wheels of living. In love service, only the wounded soldier can serve. Draw back. And on the way home, the doctor realizes the truth because as he's walking down the street, all these doors come flying open, yelling, come in here. A daughter only talks to you. She locks herself in the bedroom. Come in here. Our son is in the bathroom and locked in and he won't come out unless you come in. And, you know, every and he realizes they're all willing to share with me because of my woundedness. So I just say to people, put a bandage on and go to work, go to school, you know, wherever. Um, and watch what people tell you. And I may add also set up shrines for yourself. Put up your own baby pictures. If you don't have some, any other pictures will be fine. And love yourself every time 
you go buy the pictures. How do we crank up that self-love? Well, I always say love yourself and love your life. It, it's accepting yourself. Um, it, it's, you know, accept, and when I say that, I mean you can love yourself and apologize to people when you don't like your behavior. Those mm -hmm. are two different things. Because I would say that, we have five kids, when they were growing up, you know, I don't like what you're doing, I love you. So they understood that there was a difference um, in, in how we were treating them. And I think it's important to verbalize your love to others as well as to yourself, you know, to demonstrate it and to care about yourself and follow your heart. I like saying, uh, let your heart make up your mind, you know, and pay attention to what feels good. Nurses have a lot of trouble loving themselves in this sense. It's one of the questions relates to survival behavior. You're asked to do a favor by a friend mm -hmm. that, or a family member that you do not want to do. What would you tell them? And almost every nurse says, oh, I would do it. Well, then you're saying no to yourself. And you got to think about that. The, um, it's okay to say no and respect yourself and love yourself. You don't have to be a doormat, you know, and uh, have everybody use you, but speak up for yourself. What advice would you give to parents for raising kids today? Well, it's really first to love them. Um, I would almost say get a pet and love them as much as you do your pets. Um, because I can't tell you how many stories there are that date back a thousand years mm -hmm. from Maimonides. If people took as good care of themselves as they do their animals, they'd suffer fewer illnesses. And recently, a woman said when her cat developed lung cancer and other cats in the house were having trouble breathing because she was a smoker and so was her husband, Doug and I now smoke in the yard. We love our cats more than the convenience of smoking indoors. We're not killing our cats anymore. We hope you're not killing yours. So she's killing her, her husband and she are killing themselves, but they take care of their cats. And I'd say to love your kids. Let them know there are rules, there's discipline, um, but to let them know that they're loved. One of our kids who was held to raise um, sent an email maybe a year ago to my wife and I thanking us for all our love because he realizes what he put us through because of what he was like. Um, and now he's thanking us because we never stopped loving him. Now, I have to add, one of the other kids said to me, you don't love me as much as my you know, brother. I said, what are you talking about? I don't get 20% of your time. You have five children and I'm not getting 20%. That's an exact quote. <laughs> I said, your brother's driving us nuts, so he gets 40%. You know? But I, I was so proud of him for speaking up. Mm -hmm. because he's a little angel who's at the end of the hall in the last bedroom. So what can he say? They don't love me. Look where they put me. Yeah, but because I don't worry if your door is shut. You know what I mean? But the boy I was talking about, Adobus Nuts, his bedroom was off the kitchen. There was a room there. So we were able to watch him and know what he's doing all the time. Um, very clever kid who could drive you nuts. But again, it's learning to love them and not worry so much what will he become what will happen uh i mean right now he's a resource he's so bright and you know see if he follows what he's interested in it's like when he went to school you get an a if he liked something and an f if he didn't he didn't care what grades he got but now if i have a problem my wife will always say to me call jeffrey because <laughs> he knows so damn much mm -hmm. um about everything yeah that he's an excellent resource. But when you're growing up, uh, let me t I have to tell you one more crazy thing about him. Because I took him to a child psychiatrist who I knew, a friend of mine, because I thought maybe he could help him. After about three or four visits, I would drop him off, come back an hour later, pick, pick him up. The psychiatrist said to me, Bernie, come in and let me just talk to you about your son. And he said, um, sit down on that sofa in front of my desk. I did said, your son sits there for a full hour and doesn't say a single word. He just stares right into my eyes. He said, a few other people have done that. It takes a lot of courage to sit here an hour. 
but your son does something that nobody else has ever done. He takes his finger and he writes on the velveteen, F-U-C-K-Y-O-U. Then he turns and stares at me. He said, nobody's ever done that. And the fact that he can do that tells me that he'll make it. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> he saved me a lot of money, you know, because there's no point in bringing him back if he isn't talking. Mm -hmm. But but that's the kind of kid he was, you know, tough and able to do it. And I think, again, to, to look at your kids in that way. What are they good at? What are their resources? And I would say, follow my parents' advice because there's so many people when I would say, what models do you live by? You didn't ask us what models we're dying by. Imagine parents saying, if something good happens, it's always followed by something bad, so don't get too happy. That's my mom. Yeah. And I'm, I have met people who are smiling because they had something nice happen and then something bad, now they don't have to worry anymore. I mean, it blew my mind. But my parents, because of the troubles they grew up with, their models were this. Do what will make you happy, which I mentioned before. Mm -hmm. When you had a problem, God is redirecting you. Something good will come of this. Mm -hmm. Material things were to make the world a better place for everyone. Now, that came mostly from my father because his father died of tuberculosis, no insurance, leaving six kids and a wife. It was hell for them to survive. And it blew my mind to hear my father say many years later, one of the best things that ever happened to me was my father dying when I was 12 years old. I said, what are you talking about? He said, it taught me what was important about life. And it's interesting because whether it's a Norman Vincent Beale saying, my mother always said, Norman, if God slams one door further down the corridor, another will be open. You know, you're hearing the same themes again. Yeah from the parents and look how these people end up because they've been given live messages by their parents. So I say, give your kids mottos to live by, not to die by, and to let them follow their hearts. So it isn't, this is what I want you to be when you grow up. Then you take their life away. It's what'll make you happy. What do you want to do? We got to start to wrap things up, but a few questions that, that come to mind. One is, you ra you raised your kids clearly, very, for lack of another term, consciously. So when you had your your child who was the most difficulty, were you flipping the mirror back on yourselves and saying, "What did we do wrong?" Or this is just how my son expresses himself? Yeah, uh, no, I I don't think I ever felt. I wish I had been trained to be a parent, let's put it that way. And I think today, instead of having, um, you know, classes on how to act in the delivery, you know, mm -hmm. uh, you should have classes on how to become a parent. You should have parenting classes. I like uh, it. And I mean that, that if you want to have a child, then you have to have a, a degree, see, a parenting degree, so that you're taught about simple things about how to raise a child. Because our oldest one said to me, how come they don't have to do what I had to do? Mm -hmm. I said, I learned something. What? All the things I asked you to do weren't important. But you see, those were my rules as a parent, what I thought was right for a child. By the time you have three, four, and five, you realize, who the hell cares what the room looks like or, you know, or other little things that are meaningless. So, as I said, we had animals living in their rooms, you know, because we were saving their lives and giving them homes. And, uh, and, and again, how you treat the pets, I'd say if you treated your kids the way you treat the pets, you would do that. Yeah, you can discipline them. Um, and... and there are some veterinarians who will tell you how to train pets. And I'd say apply those words to your kids. You know, yes, love and discipline and all these things, exercise. But if you put them all together, you can raise your kids the same way. And uh, Robert Frost said it very well. He said, love, hope is, excuse me, home is a place that when you go there, they have to take you in. And that's something. If the kids feel... I'm loved. They know they can come home. They know they're safe there. And that's why I think the son who drove us crazy sent us that thank you. Mm -hmm. um, and I would go into schools and talk there to the kids to try to let them know.
because we can, maybe this is the best message of all, that we can reparent others. See? You can do it with your show if you let people know you love them. I learned I could do it by how I responded to them. The opposite of love is indifference, rejection, and abuse. So I would see people in my office who were killing themselves. I mean, you'd say, why do people smoke? Why are they 200 pounds overweight? Because they weren't loved. That's why. And I would always give them return appointments, even though they never listened to anything I said. And I saw after three or four months, they began to listen because I must be worth something. He keeps telling me to come back. Nobody else ever has. And one young lady put it very well to me. She was suicidal. Mm -hmm. She said, you're my CD. I said, what the hell are you talking about? You're my chosen dad. That became something I prescribed for people. I mean, I had a phone call one day asking me for Jack Kevorkian's phone number so she could end up ending her life. Mm -hmm. Brain tumor, a father who sexually abused her. I want to be dead. You have Jack Kevorkian's phone number. I said, no, I love you. You're a child of God. Draw some pictures for me. And I can tell you, the pictures spoke of her life, you know, and the woundedness and what happened. But she's alive today, and I still have this on my desk. If you want to close with something, when I say this, it's a card, one of the cards from her. If your world got a little sunnier every time I thought of you, you'd have a great tan by now. And the smile ran across my face today because you ran across my mind. Funny how often that happens. And I got her to change her name. I mean, she still goes by, you know, two names now. But to become a new person. And she's alive today. And love, we love each other. You know, she's like a child. And I say, I get more cards from her than I do from our biological children. Because it meant so much to her. And it means a hell of a lot to me, too. That, to, to summarize it in a sentence... I've done something real at last, that when you make a difference in somebody's life, that's what we're here for. It can be writing a book that helps millions of people, or it can be answering a phone call and saying, I love you, um, and saving a life. Thank you, Bernie. I love you. Thank, Thank you. you. I've got three quick wrap-up questions. The first, you, you kind of made a Jungian slip a minute ago when I had wanted to ask this question, and you brought up the word hope. I've mm. got to ask, what oh. do hope, miracle, and sex have to do with one another? <laughs> one day, what started this, um, my wife and I were going to get to the airport. Mm -hmm. We had it, <clears throat> the cat named Miracle. Uh, named after a cat that appeared in a lady's dream and said, my name is Miracle, here's how you treat your cancer. And she did it as well. So one of our kids came in with this little kitten, it's Miracle. Then you get a cat named Hope and a dog named Sex. But it started with uh, running around the house, not completely dressed, because my wife said, hey, we want to go to the airport, but where's Miracle? So the two of us run out of the house, scantily clad, screaming, miracle, miracle, miracle. And then my wife said, stop. I said, why? The neighbors don't know what is going on here. We're running around the house screaming, miracle. So think about it. See, you get a dog named Sex. The neighbors complained about the dog because he was running over to their house and chasing their dogs. So I meet them and stop and shop. They said, hey, I got a question for you. What is it? Are you having any problems with sex this week? <laughs> they never bothered me again. <laughs> so if you want to get your neighbors to leave you alone, run around screaming, miracle, hope, sex, uh, or just yelling to your wife, where, sh where is sex? Where shall we have sex? And, you know, it could be, honey, I mean, the answer is put them in the front yard. But, um, <laughs> you know, but the neighbors don't know what the hell is going on there. So make sure you name your animals, miracle, hope, and sex. Thank you. What personally brings you, it's a question I believe I probably asked you last time, but we like to ask every time the end, what personally brings you the greatest happiness or what I call the woohoo factor? I was thinking about that today. I think that when you love yourself and others, you create beauty in the world. 
I, I was taking care of a young lady who'd been severely burned. And I got her a job at a nursing home because I knew that her burns would be exposed because she would wear turtlenecks and long sleeves when it was 90 degrees outside. Mm -hmm. And when she came in the office, I said, Madeline, what's happened with the job? Nobody noticed my scars. I said, Madeline, when you're giving love, you're beautiful. You want to know my gift? Mm -hmm. Years later, phone rings. Dr. Siegel, what is it? My father died and I'm getting married. I want you to be my father at my wedding. And the song she played when we danced was Kenny Rogers. Through the years, you never let me down. You turned my life around. What a gift. And that's the real. See, I'd say love others. They become beautiful. And when you're giving that love, what do they see when they look at you? A beautiful person. And it doesn't have anything to do with, you know, whether you have a scar or anything else. You become a beautiful person when you love. That is a woohoo. And, you know, a childlike sense of humor added to it. I say, build your life out of the bricks of love. Hold them together with the cement of humor and laughter. Oh, let me, for the, for the women who are watching this, mm -hmm. I got a real important point from my wife. When your husband comes in, mad as hell, what do you do? What, I don't know. what do you do? My wife turns and says, honey, you're so handsome when you're angry. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> I melt. And if that doesn't work, she then says, you're upsetting the pets. They're all around you looking at you, wondering why you're making so much noise. And, you know, she's so wonderful at that. Um, uh, I can't stop telling stories about her because she means it. But she was about to have surgery for breast cancer a number of years ago. The anesthesiologist knows me. And I knew he wanted to impress me. What a wonderful job he'll do taking care of my wife. He came in, you know, with the stethoscope and the chart and looking very efficient. And he sits down and my wife said, you're quite a handsome man. And he melted, you know. And I realized surgery is going to be delayed because it was now like the two of them were on a date, mm -hmm. you know, chatting with each other. See, it's two people now, not, you know, a disease and surgery. And yeah, and that's what she's so good at. No, what a lovely smile. You're so handsome. When she's always doing that, I say she has a lot of business, you know, eye problems. And then the people laugh. But um, she means it and shares it with people. And, uh, you know, when I act crazy, I like the kid. And so between the two of us, people relax and feel safe and comfortable. And one word of warning, though, because I have a childlike sense of humor that at times gets me into trouble because people don't have a sense of humor. So when a new neighbor moves in whose son is a drummer and I leave them a note, like an official letter from the community uh, group saying that if there's a drummer in your house, you have to provide improved, uh, you know, housing for the neighbors so we don't hear the drums or you have to stop drumming. They came banging on my door wondering what the hell's going on. What do you, I said, I'm kidding. My wife explained. It's a joke. He's kidding. They didn't think it was funny. See, you know, what do you mean? We have to fix our house or fix your house because our son plays the drums. Yeah. I mean, actually, I love hearing them because one of our sons was a drummer, but I couldn't help it. I left this crazy note in their mailbox, you know, making it look like a very official letter mm -hmm. from uh, the community group. So, again, I'd say be careful if you have a childlike sense of humor that people know that you're a child and know you're kidding. I like it. I thought the note might say something like, please make sure to only play the drums at night and loudly. <laughs> <laughs> um, where can people go to find your blog, to find your book, and to find out more? The best place is start at the website, Bernie Siegel, S-I-E-G-E-L-M-D. Uh, you know, www.berniesiegelmd.com. And they can communicate with me through that. Contact us is me. I don't have people between me and other people. Mm -hmm. um, and all the books and other things are there, too. Um, you know, CDs, books uh, that they can order through a place that's run by family members, wisdomoftheages.biz. Um, and they can do that through that. Perfect. And if you didn't catch that, if you're driving down the road, come on over to inspirenationshow.com. We'll get you over to Bernie as well. 
Ernie, I can't thank you enough. Before I let you go, you've given a lot of words, so you may not have any more. Any last words of wisdom yeah. you want to share with people? I never stop talking. And people interviewing me always say, we're running out of time. I say, let's remember, we are all going to run out of time someday. So enjoy your life's time. And there's a wonderful book that I have on my desk. Mm -hmm. I may read a couple of words. It's called uh, The Time of Your Life by William Soroyan. I love the man. I would recommend a book, a novel of his called The Human Comedy. Mm -hmm. But the end of the first page where he talks about the book, I, I have this chisel that's going to be chiseled on my headstone and my wife's. I mean this seriously. In the time of your life, live. So that in that wondrous time, you shall not add to the misery and sorrow of the world, but shall smile to the infinite delight and mystery of it. And that's my advice for the world. Woohoo! Well, thank you so much for being on the show. It's been a true honor and a joy. And uh, I think people are going to get a lot out of this. And give yourself credit, which we haven't talked about. It's a hell of a lot harder for men to do this because they're busy thinking. I can't work anymore. What's the point of living? I hear that in the office while they're sitting there with their wife and children. And the women are saying, I can't die till you're married and out of the house. But we all need to take care of ourselves and develop relationships and give your life meaning. Amen. And woohoo! Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Bernie. For everyone out there, this is Michael Sandler saying, be well, have fun, get the art of healing, laugh yourself silly, and love yourself silly, and shine bright. Woohoo! Thanks so much for watching. If you enjoyed it, be sure to like, like below. Also, leave your comments. Have some real fun with it. Subscribe to our channel where you're going to get more great videos, more interviews coming up. And check out our website, InspireNationShow.com. That's where you'll find tips, blogs, information, videos you won't find anywhere else, and useful and helpful resources to really help you kickstart your life and to shine bright. Thanks so much again. Thank you for your support. Like, 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 comment, subscribe. See the website. Thanks so much and have fun. Of course, shine bright. Woohoo! <laughs>